Hello? Uh, can you guys hear me? Take that as a yes. Um, my name is Chris Atanasio. I'm an engineer at Google. Uh, and today I'd like to uh, give you an introduction to the Google Maps API. Could you put uh, my laptop up, up on the screen, please? Uh, so this is actually kind of a, a play along at home session. I don't know if any of you brought your laptops, uh, but if you did, if you type in that URL right there, uh, you can follow along with these slides uh, on your own laptop. It doesn't, doesn't look like many of you have laptops, but some of you do. Uh, I'm told you should be able to get Wi-Fi access in here, although I haven't tried it out. I'll just, uh, I'll give you a second to get that URL. So these slides, uh, I've put them up on my Google Pages uh, website, so they'll be here afterwards too if you want to come back later and take a look. Uh, you just need to write down that URL right there. Uh, so this is going to be actually kind of an interactive session. Um, I have some examples I'd like to show you of uses of the Maps API, and after that, uh, we're just going to write some code, and I might ask you some questions. Uh, don't worry, they won't be uh, too bad. Um, so let's begin. Uh, maybe the most important link I can give you first of all right now, well, this is the most important link I can give you right now, of course, uh, but maybe the second most important link I can give you uh, are these references right here. Uh, there is a really a pretty good uh, reference to the API online. I'm sorry it's not in Japanese yet, we're working on that, uh, but if you have any questions, if you're trying to figure out how to write code, uh, often you can look at this reference um, and it might have the answers to your questions. So what on earth is a Maps API site? Uh, or what can I do with the Maps API? Uh, to answer this, I just want to show you some examples. Uh, some people have done some, in my opinion, uh, great things, amazing things. Uh, here we go. How many of you know what this site is? Has anyone seen this before? Oh wow, oh wow, okay, so we have at least 50, 70 percent. Uh, this is Hatena's map site. Uh, Hatena was actually a, uh, an early adopter of the Maps API. They were using it before we even had uh, Japanese map tiles. So before we had a Japanese map um, on Google Maps, Hatena was already using our API, it's impressive. Uh, and what this is, this is a site of user-generated content that's been put on the map. Uh, See if I can find some examples. Somebody ate some pretty good udon right here. I don't know where that is. Um, and so they've created a, a, a user-generated content site using the API. Uh, this is another site using the API. This is one of my favorites. I think it's quite amazing. Um, you know how sometimes you want to, you really need to, to send a letter, but you don't know where the post box is, you don't know where to put that letter in. Uh, people have collected the locations, a huge number of post boxes all over Tokyo, all over Japan, I think, I should check. Uh, but so you can find, uh oh, I don't know if this is gonna work. <laughs> uh, you can say, let's say I live, uh, let's li say I live in Sedagayaku here, and hopefully this is gonna work. <laughs> um, I think we need that, uh, that theme music back on now. Um, you can use this to find a, uh, a post box near your house. And so this, there are some problems right now with uh, a lot of markers on the screen at once. There's actually, uh, I'll show you a way you can deal with that later uh, and make your site faster. So that, that's a, a cool, I don't know, a useful example, I think. Example number three, this is my favorite one, although it's completely useless. I don't know if you've seen this before. This is some guy walking to the Daibutsu, you ready? And look, he's, he's got a shadow. Uh, I, I think oh, this is an amazing site. Uh, but see, you see he's, he's taken this path and he's, he's put a little animated character and he's, he's walking them along the map. Uh, it's an example of what you can do using the Maps API. Uh, so two more recent, recent sites you may or, not, may or may have not heard of before. Uh, weather bunk. This is an, 
largely international weather map site. It's pretty cool. Uh, it appears to work pretty well for Japan. Uh, we can zoom in here somehow. I don't want to go to Mount Fuji. Here we go. Um, and you can find a local weather report for your area where you are. Kind of a neat idea. All right, last example, I promise. Then, we, then we'll start writing some code. Uh, this is actually my favorite. I think this is a, a brilliant idea. Um, we have a bunch of people's pictures. This is, again, uh, user-generated content. Um, and people have plotted where on the map they've taken their pictures or where on the map uh, these pictures show. Um, and there's a very interesting functionality. You'll notice that as I move the map, I think I need to zoom in for this to work better. As I move the map, the pictures that I see on the left change. So what we're actually seeing on the left uh, is a collection, an assortment of the pictures that this site has for the area that we're looking at. Uh, so just by, just by looking at an area on this map, I can get a feel for what it looks like. So I'm, I'm in downtown Tokyo, right? You've got Tokyo Tower. Uh, looks like Tokyo to me. Let's say we go west a little bit. And you have pictures of Mount Fuji. And uh, this is cool in itself. My favorite part is that people have been putting these pictures in all over the world. So I can go to France. Am I going to get some good pictures? I haven't tried this yet. So you can get a feeling for what the area looks like. Uh, yeah. So I thought that was a pretty cool use of the Maps API. <laughs> they apparently make good use of the browser history as well. All right, let's write some code. So admittedly, uh, if you're trying to make something very complicated, very uh, kind of big and powerful, like this last one I showed you, Panoramio, it takes, it takes a bit of code. Uh, I'm not going to lie, lie to you. Uh, but also, you can actually make an amazingly powerful site with just a very little bit of code. Uh, and so I'd like to start right there. Uh, I wonder if you can read this. I, I think you can probably read this. It's pretty big. Uh, this is how you load uh, the Google Maps API into a web page. So this is something you'd, you'd paste into the HTML uh, of your web page. Uh, this first line is where uh, you actually download the Google Maps API. You download the functions that you call uh, to draw a map. And there's one other important piece about uh, this code right here. Um, we make a div on the map. A div is just an HTML uh, element that has some size, and you can put things inside. Uh, and so we choose to put a div on the, on the HTML page, and then we'll draw our map inside that div. So there's two important things about this URL right here. Uh, maybe the most important is uh, the key. So you need, to, uh, you need to sign up for a key to use the Maps API. Uh, and why do you need a key? Uh, we need to track uh, how, met, how much traffic you're sending us. So how, how many hits are we getting from your site? Um, uh, for the most part, this doesn't make a difference. Uh, but if you send us a huge amount of traffic, we may need uh, to provision more servers, and we may need to worry about this. Uh, so we, we care um, kind of how much traffic is coming from one site. Um, there's a, another, uh, another reason you need a key. Um, so the Maps API is uh, free for use. Uh, there's no charge. You can put this on your website. Um, 
except there is a cap on the number of uh, page views. That is the number of, of times you can show a user a map a day. Uh, I don't remember what that cap is right now. I think it's around 10,000 or 100,000. It's pretty large. It's uh, larger than most people need. Um, and we use this key to track that cap. So this is why you need a key. Um, because as I said before, if you, if you think you're going to get a lot of traffic, um, we, we, we may need to limit that traffic if our servers become overloaded. Um, or uh, we may want to actually contact you about that directly. Uh, so when you register for a key, uh, we ask you to give us some contact information. Uh, it's not hard to get a key. I believe there's a place linked right off this site. Let's see if I can find it right now. Key. Sign up for Maps API key. So I've clicked on the documentation and there's a link right here. Basically I need to agree to this. I need to enter the website the URL of my website, and then I get a key. It's that easy. And actually, the restrictions, 500,000 page views. OK, so for, for with one key, you get 500,000 page views. So it shouldn't be a problem for most of you. Um. Let's talk a little bit more about the key. So I've told you that the it's free to use the Maps API. You don't need to pay money. Um, unless you want to do more than 500,000 page views. If you really have that much traffic, uh, we, may, we, may want to talk about, um, <laughs> we may want to talk about a deal. Uh, th the other restriction for using the Maps API uh, is it needs to be on the public internet. Um, the philosophy is kind of, uh, we're giving uh, you an API uh, it's kind of like the open source philosophy. We're giving you an API to use to make sites of, but we'd like you to show those, uh, we'd like these, these sites to enrich the internet. Um, there is also an option to use the Maps API um, on like an internal site, like a company intranet. And for that, we have a product called the, uh, the Enterprise Maps API. Uh, and this is suited more for business customers. Let's say uh, uh, you had an internal website at your company and you wanted to use the API. We, we, would, prob we would ask you to be uh, an enterprise customer. Um, and actually, going along with being an enter enterprise customer, uh, there's advantages. For example, uh, phone support. You'd get someone to call on the phone. Uh, also, you could, I think you could negotiate quite uh, many more page views. You wouldn't have the 500,000 page view cap. Uh, it's, a, it's a different package meant more for businesses uh, and their needs uh, versus the, the usual free API uh, we think should meet most users' needs, and all you need to do is register a key. So I've spoken way too long about the key, so I think I should move on now. There's just one more thing about the uh, this uh, URL, which may be important. So when I download the Maps API code, I specify a version number. I want version two of the Maps API. Uh, so why is this important? Um, every about two weeks right now, uh, we launch a new version of the Maps API. New code goes out. Uh, so when I specify here I want version two, uh, some magic happens on the server and I actually get the latest version two. I get latest, I get version two point, it must be 2.86, 2.9. I don't know, does anyone know the latest, what the version we're up to right now? Maybe not. Uh, but sometimes we push out bugs. This is kind of rare. Or sometimes we push out feature enhancements that you wouldn't want. Uh, and so one thing you can use this for is instead of writing V equals two, I could write V equals 2.90. If I write V equals 2.90, I always get the V equals 2.90 version of the API. I know my site will never change. This is kind of a useful feature. Um, um, I don't want to spend too much time on V because this is kind of the uninteresting part, but if you have questions, uh, please come up and ask me later. I can tell you all about it. I think we should write, start writing some code. So just to review, we've downloaded the code. We've downloaded, we've, uh, we've kind of installed the Maps API into our page. We've made a div, which is where we're going to put the map. And now we just need to write some code. Uh, which actually generates the map. Uh, and so this is, this is an, a fun little interactive page. You can download this and play with it later. 
uh, but I can actually edit this code here and I can run it to see what happens. So you see with these two lines, we've brought up a map of uh, near Shinju, uh, around Shinjuku, I guess. All right, let's start thinking about the code. I'd like to ask, can anyone tell me what the 13 means? Raise your hand if you, if you think you might know. Oh, I got a hand right here. Uh, can I have a, a microphone? Is, can I have some staff running around with the microphone? All right. This is the scale of the map, is it not? I'm oh, sorry. No, I, 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 uh, zoom, yes. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. I, I speak a little bit. Uh, this is the zoom of the map. Very good. Uh, we have currently 19 zoom levels. If I change this to zoom zero, you get the whole world. Uh, in, actually, it's one image. Uh, one tile, we call it. We have a 512 pixel by 512 pixel tile. And at zoom zero, that contains the entire world. If we zoom in once, we go to zoom one. We have the whole world in, actually it's four tiles now. So we zoomed in once, we get twice as many pixels in the X, we get twice as many pixels in the Y. Is that clear? So as you imagine, we could zoom in quite a bit. Zoom 19. Oh, maybe that's a bit too far. But you can use the zoom parameter control. Uh, how far zoomed in you are on the map? All right, I'm gonna run a piece of code. This is fun, you ready? Did you see it move? One more time. Did you see it? So this is the code that generated that. These lines look familiar. We just saw them before. These are new. Can anyone tell me what this value is? Oh dear, I'm sorry. In the front? Time. Time, yes. Measured how? Yes. This is 2,000 milliseconds. Very good. One of the cool things you can do in JavaScript, I can say run some code after a timeout. So. What this code does is after a timeout of 2,000 milliseconds, that's two seconds, uh, we run this piece of code right here. Pan two. Uh, the word pan means to kind of slide across. I'll give you another example. There's actually another function called move to. Have a JavaScript error. Hmm. Well, I'll have to look that up in the reference. I thought it was called move to. But let's keep going, because we're not at the interesting stuff yet. You can add controls to a map. So these are controls. I can select maps, satellite imagery, or a combination of the both. I'm sorry, I should have said, that's called the GMAP type control. These things in the upper right, those are called map types. This in the upper left is called a map control. 
you notice it's a G small map control. Uh, it's good for uh, small maps. All right, I'm, I'm gonna try changing this and seeing if it works again, you ready? I believe there's also a G large map control. Uh, this is maybe the control you're familiar with, looking at the maps site. All right, now we're getting into code that does stuff. Oh, that's not very readable. Uh. So do you see what happens? Every time I drop the map, the value changes. Someone tell me what this code is doing. Maybe I should give you a hint. This right here, I believe it's a div. It has the ID message. I'm sorry, can, uh, I, think we, I think we need you on a mic so we can get translation, I'm sorry. Okay. So I think what it does is at the end of a movement, so when you let go of the mouse, it calls the function, the function defined there in line, to get the coordinates of the center of the map yep. and then update the, in HTML of the div, with the ID of message, I think. <laughs> That's exactly right. One of the cool things you can do is you can add what's called a listener to an event. So when, a, when an event happens, I get a callback. I can get a piece of my code called when an event happens. So in this case, the map fires an event called move end every time I, I let go of the map. So I'm just, I'm simply registering some code to be called when that move end uh, event happens. Um, give you a quick example here. Can I bring up my example? You notice, I believe the pictures change when I let go of the map. So one way to accomplish this would be to catch the move end event and to send a message to the server and fetch new data. One of these days I'll learn to use multiple browser windows too. Here we are. This is a quick one. I don't need to ask you any questions. Um, we call these info windows. That's kind of a technical term. Uh, you could call it a balloon, you could call it um, a bubble on the map, but uh, I don't know what those things mean. Uh, so we've chosen to call these info windows, just to be clear. Uh, so it's just a pretty simple piece of code to make an info window. I think I need to down the font size so you can read this. Ready? So you notice every time I press this button, I get 10 new markers on the map. Didn't help much. So 
Say we have some, some logic that does something. Can somebody uh, take, an, take an attempt and try to explain to me what this logic does here? Oh, right here. Answer is the rotor in your comments. <laughs> <laughs> yes? <laughs> uh, random 10 uh, no, points. So can you tell me what happens right here? Wait, let me ask you a, a sub question of that. Can you guess the range of values? Can you guess what the range of values is that this function could return? Uh, there's one. Yes, returns a value between zero and one, exactly right. So the span is kind of a technical term, but the span, uh, is the distance across the map. It's the height of our map. So th this calculation that happens here is we take the, the latitude of the southwest corner. Uh, I wish we had a map to show. We take the latitude of the southwest corner. That's right here. And we multiply it by, I'm sorry, we add the span times a random number between zero and one. So remember the span is this height right here. And so we take a random uh, proportion of that span and we add it to the latitude for this bottom left corner. So that's the kind of the y value of the bottom here. And so we end up generating a random number which is on this map. Did you see how that works? I don't know, I thought that was kind of an interesting example. But on we go. So we're going to use another listener here. So before we had a move end event and now we have a click event. So this time I'm gonna ask you uh, if you can tell me what this code does before I press run. Can anyone tell me what this code does. Right here, please. Microphone. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, it toggles. Uh, if you click on a marker, it will disappear. And if, if, if you click on non-marker point, there will be marker. That's exactly right. I think I must be going too slow for you guys. Uh, but just so to re repeat the answer. Uh, this is the function. Uh, that gets called on a click event. Uh, and you notice that this time uh, we get, this function gets two uh, parameters. It gets the point which was clicked and also if a marker was clicked, uh, it gets kind of a handle to that marker. And so the code is quite simple. As you can see, if we have uh, a marker, we er erase it. If we did not have one, we make a new one. So let's just see that happen. Click, click, remove, remove. So it's just another event. Uh, it's another example of using, uh, adding a listener to an event. Uh, it's a really quite a powerful mechanism, I think. All right, now I have a hard one for you. Or it's kind of interesting in a computer science-y kind of way. You notice we have a function here that we attach to a click event.
This is defined outside that function. So we've called create marker. And so we have a local variable number at this place here. Uh, and we actually use that, uh, we use that in our code inside our closure. I guess I don't have a question to ask about this. Um, but maybe the point is that JavaScript is a very powerful language. Uh, it supports, uh, I believe they're called closures. Um, code I write in here can refer to a variable which may not, um, may not really exist in our current frame after we've returned. So I didn't explain that very well. Uh, when we call this function create marker, we have this variable number and we make use of it. Uh, but then we return and this number is not defined anymore. We leave the scope of this function right here. Uh, but we can continue referring to uh, this variable number even after we've left the scope. And you see we end up with um, marker number nine, marker number eight. I see some glazed faces. I think I did a pretty bad job explaining. Uh, but the point is, uh, JavaScript is a pretty powerful programming language. Uh, you have closures. Uh, you have inheritance of types. Uh, it's something I recommend looking at. All right, the next one we can skip because it's quick. You can add tabs to your info windows. It's kind of useful if you have more data than fits or more data than you'd like to put on one page. Um, and it's not very much code. It's just right here. Uh, you can customize markers. So remember how we call this an info window? Uh, just another technological word we use. We call these markers. And you can change the image used for a marker. Uh, you don't have to use the default bubble. So you can see in this case, we're loading an image. Uh, we're loading a ride finder image. That's these small ones here. Uh, but this can really be any, any image. Um, I'm trying to think if I know one off the top of my head. Uh, I don't know, what do you guys want to look for? Uh, ponies. There we go, those are nice pictures. It's gonna work, I'm not sure. Oh, that's gonna be kind of big. <laughs> Well, let's, let's see what happens. I'm kind of curious if this is going to work. So in theory, we should be able to put really any image in here. <laughs> Do you see them? Uh, they're kind of small. Hold on. <laughs> oh, I know what the problem is. Let's make them a little bit bigger. There we go. I call this ponies in Tokyo, thank you. I'm probably gonna crash this web browser soon. <laughs> um, moving on. I think I should stop this code from running all night. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, it's set. Um, this example isn't so interesting. I'm gonna skip it. Basically, you can make a, a cast. <laughs> uh, you don't have to repeat the same code. You can make kind of a template for what an icon should look like and then just tweak a little bit. Uh, so you can make an E icon, an I icon uh, without a whole bunch of work. Let's, let's go to something more interesting. This is great. This one is good. Um, XML is useful uh, in some ways. You can store data in XML and there's readers and writers you can use to edit this data. Uh, and so we also have a way to pull XML into the Maps API. Uh, so we, I have a file. The contents look kind of like this. Do I have a link to the? No, unfortunately. I've placed a file in the same directory called data.xml. And it just contains a bunch of points like this. 
So I can make a call called gxml.parse data. This will actually download that data file uh, and parse the XML contents. Uh, and it gets, it gets the data into the form that I can manipulate it uh, in JavaScript. This is pretty, this is pretty powerful. You notice uh, I say lat equals and then a latitude. I can pull that back out by calling get attribute. Uh, one reason this is really useful, uh, as you guys probably know, if you've studied much computer science, uh, code is very hard to, it's very hard to guarantee that code works, to look at code and to know that, oh, that code must work. I know that code's gonna run. And even when you think that, there's usually a bug somewhere. Uh, so editing code is dangerous. Uh, the advantage of taking your data and putting it in a file is you can edit that data, you can update that data without having to touch your code. Your code will continue to work as it did before. Uh, so this is a reason that it's a, kind of a powerful uh, separation of data and code. This is a whole bunch of code, which is probably painful to read, but it's got a cool effect. You can make custom map controls too. So really, almost everything you see about this map screen here is customizable. Uh, so you notice we have buttons now that instead of being uh, the pluses and the minuses before, we have a, we've made our own zoom in and zoom out buttons. Um, but the more you want to customize, the more code you need to put in. What does this one do? Another example of customization. Um, We have a concept of an overlay. Let me highlight that word. An overlay is something you put on the map using your code. And so to tell the truth, actually these, these markers are overlays. Um, and really you can make other kinds of overlays too. In this case we've overlain a, it's kind of a gray rectangle. It's just something we've plotted right on the map. I bet we can change the color, hold on. Rectangle. Oh, how do I make a size? What's the Java color look like? Uh, JavaScript color, I believe it's this. Uh, so you can generate these overlays using code, which is another powerful technique. Um, it's not just images that you grab from a website. You can actually write code to put overlays on the map as well. Okay, geocoding. Uh, there's something called a geocoder which you can use. A geocoder takes a description of an address, like Tokyo Tower, and it figures out uh, where is this place on the map, or where is this place on the earth actually. It is my lucky day. That looks like where Tokyo Tower belongs. Is it? I'm not sure now. Let's do an easier to understand. Oh wait, here we go. Uh, let me make sure that's the right place. Zoom in a bit. Okay, I, I wrote some of the geocoding code too, so I'm, I'm happy it worked this time. So how do we use this? It's actually pretty simple. There's one piece of uh, code you can't see here, so let me tell you about it. When I press go right here, it takes the text in the box and it calls a JavaScript function called show address, this one right here. So that's the only thing to keep in mind. You notice we're using another callback here. This is pretty simple, I think I can just explain it. Uh, 
we pass the geocoder the address. That's the thing I typed in the box. And it calls, it looks, it gets the result and it calls us back into our callback. That's this function we pass right here. And it passes as a, as a parameter the geocode result. That is the point uh, that our address represents. And so we simply have the, we have some simple code here. If, if we didn't get a point, that means the geocode failed. We make this alert box not found. I can show that to you. Well, I think I can. Uh, Chris's house. I don't think this is going to work. No, Chris's house not found. That's too bad. Um, but if it's a place that does work, for example, um, I don't know. Let's let's. Where do you want to go, Paris? Um, it takes us to Paris. One very powerful uh, feature of this geocoder is it supports quite a few countries right now. I believe it works in uh, U.S., Canada. Uh, I'm not sure about the U.K. It does work in most of Europe. It works in Japan, Australia, perhaps. Um, and we're basically, this is one of the things we're working on. We're working on getting more data into this. Uh, so if you use this geocoder, the, the number of countries you support uh, will actually grow with time, which is kind of exciting. All right, I want to wrap this up quick because uh, I want to try to answer questions too. Those are always more fun. Uh, but this is an important section. Uh, if your code doesn't work, and it usually doesn't the first time unless you're a guru, uh, these are some things you can do. Uh, and you can read this yourself afterwards. Uh, the Venkman debugger, is, it works pretty well, or use the Microsoft Script debugger if using IE. Um, it's a really, the really full-featured debuggers you can use to test uh, your JavaScript code. Um, there's a, a Maps API discussion group. We actually have a Japanese one too. Uh, you can post to the English or the Japanese. Uh, um, and there's, there's other resources as well. All right, three quick demos, well, maybe four, and then we're basically done. Uh, there's a piece of code, this is actually a newer feature, new additions to the API, called the Marker Manager. Why is this useful? Um, you remember what happened before when I tried to show probably close to 1,000 post boxes on a small map? Uh, it didn't work so well. And actually, when I'm looking at a kind of a zoomed out map, I don't need to see um, you know, 1,000 post boxes. I only need to see uh, a few. Uh, what have I done? Oh, there, that must have been the problem. OK. But so we have a demo of a weather map. Uh, this isn't real data. We made this data up. It's much easier that way for the purpose of the demo. Um, but you notice as you zoom in, I started to wonder if this code works better in Firefox than IE. I guess that's why they call them new features. <laughs> Tell you what, um, <laughs> oh, how does this work? <laughs> Which one do I press? Task, this one here? I'm kind of scared to push this again, although I think it really should work, so I will. Oh, Chris, you fool. Anyway, let me just explain what it does. And it works much, it worked much better on my laptop at home. Um, we say that when we're at zoom level three, 20 markers is enough. That's enough to give a general idea 
Um, and so at Zoom Level 3, we, we add the 20 markers that are appropriate for Zoom Level 3. Uh, but once you've zoomed in a little bit more, uh, and now you'd, you'd like to show more specific data. You'd like to show more specific markers. So we tell the marker manager, that's this, this new feature, uh, that once you're at Zoom Level 6, I want you to display this icon set instead. And I advise you test it on all browsers before actually launching a site with it. Um, but it's kind of neat. It's uh, uh, we're working into the space of having a very smart client. Uh, the code running on your browser is now deciding when to show what. It, so you don't need to make a server communication to decide uh, once I've zoomed in, I should show these new sets of markers. Uh, so it's a powerful technique. Tell you what, I hate wasting time. While I uh, restart this task, are there any question or two I could answer? Anyone have any questions so far? Anything, uh, Maps API, Japan Maps? Um, what did you eat for breakfast? Uh, explore. Oh, question, yeah. In regards to API keys, I have a question. I need a, sounds like a hard question, thank you. All right. In regards to API keys, I have a question. When there's a traffic of a half a million, and when you have, I understand about this uh, cap, but for the cap key itself, if you want to uh, expose this to other people, is that possible to do that? For example, if there's an API key, and if you want to uh, place it into a client uh, software and then distribute it, is it possible to do so? Uh, let me repeat the question to make sure I understood it. Uh, are you asking, uh, can you distribute a key in client software? Uh, yeah, so is. Hi. Hi. Um, That's right. Hmm. I suspect yes, as long as you can uh, meet all the restrictions of the Maps API. Uh, so the, the page must be globally viewable is one restriction. Uh, it can't be on the internet. Uh, so if the, if the software that you distribute is something that can be used freely on the internet, um, that's good. Um, there's actually another restriction I'd forgotten about until now. You cannot charge money uh, for the site using the Maps API, uh, using the regular key. Um, that is, that's a, bit, that's a, a bigger restriction. Uh, if you want to not have these restrictions, uh, so if you want to charge money for your site, or if you want to not make it freely available, uh, we ask you to use the enterprise uh, package, and that, that's probably a, a package more suited for your needs. Does that, does that answer your question? Hi. Hi. Oh. All right. Thank yes, you. I understand. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. I'm going to try to finish this presentation and then open it back up for questions. Um, you can look at these examples afterwards. They're just examples of what you can do. One specific one I, I want to point out is recently we've been able to take KML, another GeoRSS feeds. These are uh, standard geospatial formats, and actually import them directly to be drawn on the map. Uh, this is kind of exciting. He's holding up the sign that says I have 10 minutes, so I got to rush now. Uh, did anyone see my uh, my blog post coming in here where I, I promised a traveling salesman problem solution? Did anyone? Ah, you don't. okay. I have to give it to you now. Okay, someone saw it. Um, so I, I didn't mean to be cheesy or to play tricks here. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the traveling salesman problem. Uh, it's, a, it's a very famous problem in computer science. Uh, and the problem is, uh, let's say I have a salesman, uh, and his name is um, Omid, and he needs to visit 100 cities in the US to give his sales talks. And so the problem is, what is the optimal path he should be taking through these cities uh, so he, he spends the least amount of time traveling? Uh, and it's an interesting problem because it's a problem which is very hard to solve using a computer. 
uh, there's, there's ways to do it, but there's, there's no great solution to write some code which is going to solve this problem and get the perfect result. Um, so I want to suggest to you a different way to solve problems like these, uh, which doesn't involve writing code directly to solve the problem. Um, and I'm just going to use uh, an example site. Uh, how do I save this to a file? Is this going to work? This one maybe? My documents, places to go. Um, and so you see uh, this file here, this is just the places I was planning to go. Um, Skiji breakfast maybe one day. Uh, go to Monte Sando, see some famous people. Uh, Zen Mall is cool, they have big suits, uh, my size suits, so I'm just gonna pick up a laptop and just things like that. And so my question is, how do I fit these all into one day? Um, and the answer is, I use a map to visualize this data differently. Um, if I was just looking at this data as a list right here, um, I, I don't know how to plan anything. Uh, it's difficult for me to comprehend this. But the idea is if we put this data on a map, I can upload this right here. And what this does is it, it simply geocodes, it uses the geocoder to geocode these locations and it plots them on a map. And I can, I can understand, um, and I really wanted to eat fish for breakfast. Uh, so maybe I, should, maybe I should go up north here. Is that that soft map up there? I can pick up my laptop. It looks like there's a train I can take down here. Uh, I can see some famous people on the way. I can head down to Shibuya by my suit, head through Gotanda by my big shoes, and I can finish up uh, at the aquarium. And that's a pretty, uh, looks like a pretty good shortest path to me. Um, so the point is, uh, Think of this as a different way to organize data, data that has um, a spatial axis. Uh, and that's the end of my talk, thank you. And uh, I didn't leave much time, but if there's any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them right now. Yes, please. In regard to domain names, there is uh, internationalized domain. There may be Japanese domains or Arabic domains in a site. And if we have Google Map uh, keys issued there, currently errors seem to arise. But are there any uh, plans to respond to that? And when do you think uh, something can be done about that? And IE7 has uh, uh, automatic functions, and so therefore we would be able, we would like to be able to accommodate that, and I'd like to request for your best regards in accommodating the new automated functions of IE7. Uh, so I, I think I have two questions here. Uh, one is, if we have uh, a site in multiple different domains, I believe right now you need to register a new API key for each domain. Is that correct? Is that did I understand that correctly? No? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Th th there was a problem of uh, using a key across multiple sites? Uh, no, that's not it. Uh, rather, it's a matter of domain names. Mm -hmm. If it's not an alphabetical domain name, such as in Japanese or Japanese characters, or uh, then there's IEDN, I think, IDN. And it's not possible to use Google Maps at such sites. But the, what are your thoughts in this regard is the question that I had. Um, I, I, I understand your question now. You're talking about sites of, uh, what do you have? Uh, there, I think there's a shibuyaiki.jp, is there not? No, that didn't work. But no, I, I, I know what you're talking about. Uh, so the question is, uh, is there are problems uh, using this, the Maps API with this right now? Uh, I did not know, I'm sorry. Uh, let me look into that. Uh, thank you for your report. Um, there may be a way to do it. Um, if you haven't yet, I would recommend uh, posting to the API discussion group. I don't know if it's been discussed there before. This is one way to find the answer. Um, and beyond that, that's definitely a bug we should be fixing. Thank you. Uh, and the, the second question was, are there new, f uh, I'm sorry, are there new features of IE, IE7 that we should be taking advantage of? Um, I myself, I don't know the answer. Um, generally, the philosophy be behind Google Maps uh, is we should try to take the full advantage of the browser. 
so let me give you uh, just an example. Um, because we're an IE, it turned out we could find a way to implement smooth scrolling very quickly, very sexy. So we use smooth scrolling in, I, in IE. Uh, if you load up Firefox, actually we have smooth scrolling disabled. Uh, we found out it was too slow. Um, so we do believe in uh, using the, the full capabilities of the browser. Uh, I myself, I'm not sure uh, if we have any plans for using special IE7 features. Um, I suspect we will. Does that answer your questions? All right, thank you. I think I have time for one question or two, maybe. One short question, please. Yeah, uh, Mike, Mike, please. In regard to geocoding, I could not understand one point about geocoding. Please allow me to ask in Japanese. When you run in Tokyo Tower, then how was it that it was determined that you go to uh, Tokyo Tower? It could be a Tokyo Tower in some amusement park, but uh, it seems uh, for that API, how is it that you got to Tokyo Tower with that? Uh, so the answer is magic. <laughs> um, no, no, it's, it's a very, very hard problem. You bring up a good point. Uh, let me give you some other examples. Uh, there are uh, many geocodes that are ambiguous. Um, I think Akasaka Eki is an example. Is that, that's not the right one. Um, there's actually f uh, at least four. I think there's just four Akasaka Eki in Tokyo. Um, there's another question of, uh, what was it, I believe? Yurakucho. So there's actually one in, the one you know, uh, which is here. I believe there's one in Osaka as well. Osaka. Uh, Osaka Shi. <laughs> I'm not sure, I can't find it right now. Uh, but there's one there as well. So what, one problem we had actually when developing this is you type in Yudokucho and it would fly to Osaka. And all the people in the office said, oh my, that's wrong, that's, you know, there's something broken here. Uh, so there's been a lot of work into trying to find the right answer, uh, but right now it's just an estimate, it's a guess. And in the places we really don't know, we return, I think, multiple results, uh, like for Akasaka Eki. Does that answer your question? Uh, all right. Um, um, very well, I'm you. sorry, I promised you more Q&A time, and now it's time for me to end, uh, but I'll be walking around today. I'll be at the reception at I think it's seven tonight, and please uh, ask me all your questions. I'm happy, I, I enjoy the, uh, them, and uh, thank you for listening to me talk for this past hour.